Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I have with me today a relatively new friend who's made a massively lasting impression upon me. Her name is Angelica Alana. She's known as Angel to her community. She is a sex, love, and relationship coach. She has been a yoga teacher in LA and London. She has been featured in Vanity Fair and Well and Good and Modern Luxury. She is devoted to supporting both women and gender non-conforming people to transform their love and their sex lives. First of all, welcome to the podcast, my love. Thanks for having me, Mama. It's so good to be here. Yeah, it's really nice to have you. Um, All of this is, you know, it's pretty much out there in the world. And to be honest, I've never interviewed anybody who calls themselves a sex and love coach because I look at folks like that, I'm laden with judgments, and (laughs) you're the first one that I've seen who is completely true, Mm. which means a lot. And it means a lot that I've asked you to come on the show because I feel your commitment to science, ancient practices, I think that those are the two things that really led me to say, okay, let's do this. Mm. Yeah. And I feel like you're watching you with Patrick, who's your partner and relatively long term, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, four years, four and a half. Yeah. And you're how old? Sorry to ask. 29, nearly 30, sat in return. No, but you're 85. Our (laughs) listener, I know that she just said 29 and you're like, all right, I'm done with this one. Don't be done. This is a wise woman. (laughs) Patrick literally just said in our gratitude, we were driving back up the mountain and he's like, I'm so grateful that I have a 95 year old with (gasps) a 29 year old um, body. body. Yeah. (laughs) So it's just funny that you said that. (laughs) Well, I I gave you back 10 years. Um, (laughs) I feel this to be true. And my listener knows that I'm very discriminating about who comes on this podcast. It's usually dear friends of mine or people that I know very well, Mm. or at least well enough to know that their, you know, work is weighty for me. There's Mm. a heaviness and a a gravity to it. And that's how I feel about you. And so my intention for this um, chat is to sort of demystify this whole conversation, take all of the judgment out and start to walk people through how you work to make sex and love uh, a real kindness between mm. two people in a couple. How do you talk about gratitude on the way back up the mountain from town? Like, I want to talk about all that stuff. Yeah. So let's start with your personal life and then we'll go into what your work looks like. Yeah, well, I, firstly, I just want to say that I sometimes have a lot of judgment around this industry, so <laughs> I totally get it. I think that uh, it's natural and normal and, and it's kind of an unregulated industry of cowboys, and cowgirls. There's a lot of charlatans around and bless all the lights, but I, I get it for anyone listening and for you too, my love, feeling that judgment because I feel it sometimes too. Yeah, I, you know, and I don't want to, but it's true. Yeah. Um, So let's talk about how, let's say my listener is in a relationship for some time and would like to bring new energy to it. Yeah. Um, And I'm thinking of this because hearing you guys talk about your gratitude in the car, Hmm. suddenly I'm like, oh, we do that at dinner, you know, but what fun to do it other times. Like just teach us about how you guys keep it super fresh and real for yourselves. Yeah, well, I I think that like if someone is in a relationship for any length of time, we know that things simply do change. That just is the truth. But I think the unfortunate thing is that society and the fairy tale and rom-coms and all of that have kind of sold us this picture that if you're not operating 
in that same way, let's call it the honeymoon phase. One of my teachers calls it the projectional love phase, which I also love. But if your sex life isn't fitting into that anymore, then something must be wrong. I must be broken. My partner must be broken. Our relationship must be broken. And sometimes that can be true, but very rarely it is. Usually it's just that it's different. And I talk a lot about with my clients, like the entry point to turn on and intimacy and connection becomes different because after the honeymoon phase, when you're projecting all of who you think someone is and who they're going to be to you, and a lot of it has to do with our childhood and not much to do with who they actually are. And then the reality of who this person is starts to poke holes in our projections. And that's when kind of the tension happens. And if we make it out of that honeymoon phase, let's say, and into really knowing a person and seeing their shadow and being super comfortable with one another. What we're left with is true intimacy. And I think we're not taught about that. And so sex then becomes this really intimate act because you're being fully seen and intimate with someone who actually knows you and who you actually know. And so I think a lot of the skill set is learning to be comfortable with intimacy. A lot of the soul work that comes along with this is learning to unearth the parts of us that resist the thing that most of us want the most. Isn't that interesting? Usually we have these deep desires for whatever it is, whether it's intimacy or connection, which is the example I'm using now, but for whatever it is that we deeply desire, we usually have other parts in some modes or methodologies. They'd call those sub-personalities. Some methodologies call it shadow, whatever you want to call it. We have these other aspects of our psyche that don't want that thing that we desire, that are worried about it or afraid of it or concerned. And so they sabotage our efforts. And so for anyone listening, whether it's sex or just life, that might sound familiar. Like I really want this thing, but why can't I let myself have it? And I think we see that in sex so much. It's interesting because you just said the thing that we want the most, I think in the aggregate, we just want to be seen. Yeah, but we're terrified of it too, right? (laughs) Especially in intimate encounters. Mm. And it's something that I've come to terms with. I didn't have the words for it. I didn't Mm. have the, um, the articulation for it until just this moment. But, oh, it's just so hard. It's Mm. hard. For me, it's hard for James, and yet when we both commit to it, communication and Mm. and clarity and kindness, compassion even, Mm. um, in our intimacy, everything flows. Yes. You know? That's the operative word, I think, is commitment. I love that word. I love the word devotion. And I think that for Patrick and I, something that was really important is and still stands to be is being on the same team whether it's in relationship to sex, whether it's in relationship to even feeling disconnected, can we be on the same team while we're disconnected? And it's that feeling of both working towards the same thing. And I think a lot of couples, and I've so been there, can get stuck in this kind of power struggle where one person, let's say, wants sex or wants connection and the other person doesn't. And so you're not on the same team. And of course, that's going to create disconnection and disharmony. And so I think the first thing is coming to terms with what do I want out of sex? Because a lot of um, particularly women and gender non-conforming people because of the lack of sexual education and pornography and all these things that don't really lean towards people with pussies. It doesn't really teach us about how to, you know, reach full engorgement, which for those listening, I mean, I was surprised when I heard this, it takes 20 to 60 minutes for most people with a pussy. And that is not what we even see on rom-coms. It's like, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. And so when we're not getting better sex, And we don't realize that that's an option on the menu or we're not fully aware of what we want or there's shame and repression in the way. God, where would we have gotten that from? (laughs) Thanks, patriarchy. Uh Uh, Then we don't know what we want. We don't know that there's better. And I think that most people do want some kind of sex, but it's not that they don't want sex. And there's this massive generalization that women want sex less. And actually what a lot of the science around this is coming out is that women just want better sex. (laughs) That's right. That's right. And so let's go straight to our listener for a moment Mm -hmm. she or they are going to their partner Mm -hmm. and trying to get a conversation going that brings that sort of 
um, patience, slowness, seeing of one another Mm. into the field without making the partner feel like there's two different teams here and there's two different energies here, but in fact, there's just one. How does that happen? I think that, I mean, it's such an obvious answer, but it's obvious perhaps because it feels true to me, which is just vulnerability, like coming to the table and saying, hey, I'm nervous about sharing this thing with you, or I have this idea of what I want, but I'm afraid that if I share it with you, maybe you will reject me or you will think I'm weird or, and just speaking to whatever it is that's truth in your heart, that's vulnerable. And that creates a space of openness and vulnerability. Um, And I'm assuming, right, that this is a person who has a trustable partner and a safe space. I'm, I'm making a lot of assumptions here in starting with that, but assuming that that's the case, I think, yeah, starting with that vulnerability. And then from that space, being clear on what it is that you want, knowing that you can change your mind. But I think that's so helpful rather than saying, I don't want this and I don't want that. Although that's okay. Like your no is powerful, but it can be so powerful to be like, Hey, let me paint you a picture. This is what I'm excited to try. And I'm also nervous and I'm also all those things, vulnerability, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. This feels really exciting to me and share with them in juicy detail what it is that you want. Yes, I love that. It's interesting because every now and again, when I say what I want, Mm. it gets misconstrued as uh, a level of selfishness. Mm. And I think what you just said in terms of like way in advance of the intimacy, just saying, hey, I want it to go like this and feel like this, and I'm scared to tell you, and I'm feeling very fragile and tender Mm. about this, I feel that to be very true and helpful. And I love that. I appreciate that. That's a big one too, like selfishness for women, especially or or people with pussies, because it is like – generally speaking, a pussy takes a lot longer. It's a yin arousal network, right? And that's not just the woo-woo spiritual side of things, although I believe in that too. It's also just the anatomy of our arousal. It takes longer usually, right, than a person with a penis. And so most of us can end up feeling like, is it okay for me to take this much time? Is it okay? Am I selfish? And so that's a beautiful, vulnerable statement. Hey, I'm realizing that it you know, it can take a little bit longer for me to feel fully alive in my arousal. And I'm feeling like scared that that's going to be selfish or worried that that won't turn you on. And, and I think that can be a huge thing during foreplay, women not able to connect to their pleasure or um, their climax because they're worried, like, am I taking too much time? So if you actually have that conversation ahead of time, vulnerably, then you guys can get on the same team about it and reach understanding so that you don't have to really, I mean, think about it. If you're in foreplay and not that anything can't be undone and rewired, everything can be, even the deepest levels of of our trauma. I, I really believe that. But if we're imprinting in our nervous system, when someone's going down on us, I believe that pleasure is a really powerful uh, tool to program our nervous system. It's why I use it pleasure practices uh, a lot for healing. And so if someone's going down on you and and you're thinking, oh my God, am I taking too long? And you're stuck in your head and what are they thinking? And is it okay down there? How does it look? How does it smell? How does it taste? All of these things that we can be concerned about. And it's kind of imprinting our nervous system. Whereas if we just come to our partner ahead of time and we have the opportunity to kind of talk about it ahead of time with regulated nervous systems, and then we can imprint more positively when we're in that powerful space of pleasure. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think the idea, it's sort of similar to any kid, friendship, parenting. It's just good to talk about it when it's not happening. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's, <laughs> yeah. the, that's always helpful like when we're not, you know, excited, angry, fearful, whatever. Let's talk about it then so yes. we can plan for very good, very, yeah. very good. Um, But I want to know from you how all of this came about. Like you were ostensibly a yoga teacher teaching Mm -hmm. in L.A. and London, which is no small feat. Mm. And then suddenly this happened. I'm so curious to hear how this all came about for you. Yeah, it's been an interesting journey. And I, I guess no journey is typical, so I'll just share it. But I 
I was in LA uh, pursuing music, which was my lifelong passion. I'd always wanted to be a singer. Everyone was like, how are you going to do that? How are you going to move to LA? And I was like, I'm going to find a way. And I did. Uh, but in LA, I developed a really unhealthy relationship with substances and sex um, and just was, you know, a party girl out of control, felt so much shame. And just because of that shame, isolated myself from all my family and friends back home. And then compounded by the fact that I felt like I wasn't making it quote unquote in the industry. And so being in musical theater, I'd actually stumbled upon, thank the goddess yoga when I was 15. And so I'd been practicing, um, for years by that point in my life, I was 22 at this point in the story, living in LA. And I, yeah, I was feeling spiritually, emotionally, financially bankrupt and I have addiction and mental health in my family. So I became starkly Mm. aware that I'm heading down a really dark, dangerous path and I have a choice and thank the goddess I had tools. I knew that spirituality for me and yoga had been something that had really supported me through supporting my family members through mental health crises and psychosis and addiction. And so luckily I had that reference point. And so I started, um, practicing again and then inviting people to my home. And then that kind of grew. And I had this like community yoga thing going on and my community members and friends were like, this is you. This is what you are supposed Mm. to be doing. When you do this work, you light up. And whenever you talk about music or modeling, you seem crushed. And I was like, I feel crushed. (laughs) And so I started there and then I fell in love and love and heartbreak and sex have always been my dojo. Uh, And I've always really always been a spiritual being. I can thank my eldest brother for that. He, I mean, in so many ways, he's been a teacher for me in his illness and addiction. He's been one of my greatest teachers, but also he's a really brilliant soul. I'm so privileged to be his sister. And from a very young age, he would teach me about, you know, pretty off the wall concepts. And so I've always had that foundation and I've always really deeply desired love and been a very sexual creature. And so that kind of was this mash together. I moved to London for love. I start teaching in studios there and kind of grieving the loss of music and this essentially ego, this who I thought I would be and how attached I was to that identity, Mm -hmm. um, which was fucking hard. It was heartbreaking really. And very quickly developed a one-to-one client base. I got so lucky. I got to say, like, you know, when you're on the right path, there's like every door slammed in my face with music. And it was like an uphill freaking battle all the time. And then the second I chose yoga, it's like, was so fast. I got so lucky. I would be having a conversation with someone saying, oh yeah, I'm like a yoga teacher and I'm just teaching at this little studio here. And they're like, amazing, come teach at this studio. And then people are like, oh, I want you to come teach privates and then word of mouth. And I had a one-to-one roster super quickly. And then very naturally they were just like wanting to talk about what they eat and their relationship with food, their relationship with their body, their relationship with their mom. And all of a sudden I'd be like, we have 15 minutes left for, for practice and asana, like let's get to it. And by that stage I was 23. I'd never met a life coach. Um, but I was essentially a life coach. That's what I was doing. I didn't realize at the time I I just called it yoga on and off the mat. I was so immersed in spirituality and reading and learning. And like, this is my obsession. It still is. And, Mm -hmm. and people wanted to hear about it. And so I was just sharing and I, you know, I didn't feel any level of authority to be like, I'm a life coach. So people were just like book a session with angel and book two hours and you'll see. (laughs) It was just kind of like that. And then I met another lover and he was a life coach, a high level life coach. And he mentored me and he helped me. And he said like, look, this is what you're here to do. This is your path. And I've always been interested, as I said, in love and sex, that's always been my dojo. And so the clients that I just attracted was always a spiritual woman or gender non-conforming person. And it was always something about a guy or a gal, something about love or sex. And again, it was very natural. It was like, and, and hey, that's not to say that it hasn't been hard. Like, you know, six and a half, seven years later, it's been a long time for me to even get to a place where like I would say, you know, I'm proud of, uh, of the work I do and where I've gotten to. So not to say it's been easy, but it's definitely been easier than music. It's like the next steps always appear. I managed to, I mean, look at you. I'm like, I said to Patrick on the way 
um, up the hill as well. I was like, I'm so grateful doing gratitude. I was grateful for you. And I was like, I'm so grateful that I'm attracting these incredible women and mentors and teachers into my life. And so, yeah, it just, this is my path. And I I say that to people, a, a lot of new coaches come to me and want to work with me. And I say, look, this isn't my business. This is my path. And the only people I want to support is not the people that need a business coach. That's not what I do. It's people that want to learn how to be an exquisite space holder and to learn these tools. And it's people that this is their path. And on the sex and love thing, I guess two and a half, three years ago, I started to realize that people were only coming to me for this, (laughs) that and new coaches and start to get more knowledge and more teachers and more mentors and more studying. And I've always been interested in Tantra since I first did my yoga certification at 19 and they talked about Tantra. I was like, ooh. And I happened to meet a lover on that retreat as well, who is a Tantra master. And I learned a lot from him. So again, love and sex has really been my dojo. Got it. What's interesting is the way in which you take the patterns of healthy relating. Mm. That's what I'm hearing. Like the true nature of compassion, the true nature of equity, the true nature of love, these patterns are sort of imprinted into you and it's not something you're trying to do. It's just something that happens. When I met you for the first time, I can finally relate uh, to our listener. We were at Joshua's house. Joshua's one of my best, best friends on the planet Earth. (laughs) He is the founder, Joshua Scott Onisco. He will be on the podcast at some point. He's the founder of Pangea Organics. He's the founder of Alpine Provisions. He's the founder of Anjou de Chec, which is a fragrance, super, super natural fragrance brand, a couple other companies too. And I met you there and was instantly disarmed. Hmm. Um, Your beauty is ridiculous, off the charts, never seen anything like it. It's like seeing a supermodel, but... Then there's this like depth of kindness, depth of listening, depth of presence that you bring to the simplest conversations. I was, you know, instantly smitten and wanted to be friends. And we got to walk a little bit on that second visit um, on the 4th of July hike, which we actually did on the 5th of July. (laughs) And it was rebels. It was Rebels, <laughs> it was just awesome getting to know you and, and realizing that indeed you are much, much older than your years in the best possible way. And yet you still have this insane body face matrix that is just, bah, I can't even go look at her picture, our <laughs> listener, Angelica, A-N-G-E-L-I-K-A, Alana, A-L-A-N-A dot com. <laughs> there are two A's in the middle there. Just go. It's like intimidating how pretty. And then the kindness comes in and you realize that this is a person who is completely authentic and has indeed taken the patterns of the best aspects of love relating and let them be imprinted upon her so that she can transmit them. That's how I feel about you. Wow. I'm so, I'm like, don't cry, Angel. <laughs> no, no, you don't, I mean, if you want to, you, you can, know, I could, but, but I'm just I like mean. so moved, my love. And just, yeah, mm. I'm so grateful to know you. And what kept flashing into my mind as you were saying that is just also my gratitude for my brother and just like his journey. And it's the most painful thing I think I've ever experienced. For, and I'm sure anyone listening has a family member who suffered with, um, mental illness, schizophrenia, addiction. And yet it taught me so much. My God, he's taught me so much. I'm so grateful to be his sister and to being around at such a young age for a really long time, essentially on visitation in psych wards and meeting people who are different and often really gifted, Mm. but just Mm -hmm. couldn't carry the burden of being themselves. And so they found ways to put that down or become someone else sometimes three times in the same conversation or, Mm -hmm. you know, all the ways that we do. And and I really get that. And so I think this work for me, like a, it saved my life, continues to save my life. It works. And I'm just like seeing the other side of when we don't have ways to process and to carry the burdens of being ourselves essentially for a while, Mm -hmm. how high the stakes are. It's like, it does feel natural because this works. I'm so excited about it. I'm like, it works for me at least and at least a faction of people. So it feels so natural to share it. I think reverence and gratitude for the 
the start that I got in life, albeit quite tumultuous, I think it really yeah. paved the way. Yeah. Is your brother's situation something that you can speak about in more detail or would you rather we move forward past that? Yeah, you know, it's something I've grappled with and and very recently one of my friends said to me, you've lived such a life and you you very rarely share your story. You you share teachings and they're so powerful, but why don't you share like your story? And I was grateful to her for the permission because I did say, you know, A, I think it was so painful for so long that I was like, couldn't whereas now I think I am in a position to share a little more and b I was always worried it might hurt or that I shouldn't share it but what I realized literally just last week I was like is that not actually the shame and stigma around mental health of me buying into that under the guise of I've thought for so long that I don't talk about this because I'm protecting someone that I love and I think yes there's of course a way to do that and and be conscious that when we speak we impact others and when others are involved in things, but also like, I just was realized like, it's actually probably good for me to share it because so many people have family members or friends or people they love that experience addiction and mental health. And if no one's talking about it, then the stigma just continues. Um, I actually wrote a little piece. It's very brief about an experience I had on visitation in psych ward. And I wonder maybe if it feels aligned, I can read it. No, that feels actually really good. That's the perfect, perfect medicine right now. It's exactly right. Okay, let me pull it up. Osama bin Laden, Osama bin Laden, a man stood in the courtyard and screamed at the windows above. He cackled with delight as agitated screams echoed back down at him. He caught me looking at him and said with a grin, maximum security, as he pointed to the windows in the second floor above. I imagined padded cells and straight jackets. I could hear them screaming. A shiver ran down my spine. A woman came towards where I sat. Her chin seemed stuck to her chest. The nurses rushed to pull her away, but I said, no, she's okay. And she plopped herself beside me. My brother was pacing back and forth, back and forth, so she kept me company. She held my shoulders tightly and with tears in her eyes, she said, you have got a beautiful voice. Do not be afraid to share it. Our eyes were locked for a moment. We weren't in a mental institution. She wasn't mad. For a moment, I felt her humanity. Stunned by what felt like psychic abilities. And then, will you come with me to meet the queen next Monday? She was off to ask my mum. Off on another adventure as madness gripped her and she travelled to places I could not and would not follow her. In all my conversations, I looked for threads I could pick up, pieces I could understand. Sometimes I would laugh at something absurd and my mum would hush me. What? It's funny, I would say, somehow feeling so connected to all these misfits and mad ones, the heartbroken ones who couldn't carry the burden of being themselves, so they became someone else, often several times in a minute, or the ones who couldn't carry the heavy weight of this reality, so they made up a new one, somehow even more dark and twisted, but tightly under their control, so perhaps somehow more safe. My brother's meds weren't working right. The walls are melting, he said, as he mimed a DJ set on imaginary decks, I came with my mum to visit every day, still dressed in my school uniform. Somehow these people didn't scare me. I wasn't repulsed or uncomfortable. I was fascinated, and most of all, I believed my brother could find his way back, and I wanted to be there when he did. Dude. Wow. (sighs) The last line. Yeah. (laughs) Gosh. I wanted to be there when he did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes he wow. did. <laughs> yep. He's now at home in Oz with your parents. Is that correct? Yeah. That's what I remember. Yes. Yeah. Safe. Good. Sober. Good. Amazing. Yeah. <sighs> mm. To our listener, I think... I think the lesson here is that, you know, seemingly weirdest, most um, troubling struggle yeah. might actually be the thing that leads you to be one of the most open and uh, devoted. <sighs> what's happened to you. Yeah. It's like if you let it break you open, which holy Jesus, it ain't mm-hmm. easy. And mm-hmm. 
And everyone has that, right? Like everyone has the way that life tries to break them open. Whoo-wee. What a ride we signed up for. <laughs> it's the weirdest one ever. <laughs> and it just keeps getting weirder. <laughs> Every second. Every second. I am so thankful for your presence here and for your wisdom. And I want to dedicate myself to having you back over time mm. because I think as you get older you're only going to get better oh I hope so I hope I make it I'm kind of Buddhist in that sense I'm like yeah maybe <laughs> hopefully maybe. hopefully I'm here <laughs> let's see yeah let's see how it goes I'm also um, bad. yeah and tell your man also Patrick I'm eagerly awaiting um can I share with our listener what you guys are creating oh yeah I can't wait till we can share like actually yeah, fulfill that. It's soon, January. Okay, amazing. So L-theanine, mm -hmm. that sort of brain amino acid superpower is going into a product that Angel and Patrick are creating that is in a tube. Mm -hmm. I've already tasted it. The most delicious adjunct for your uh, hot drinks, mm -hmm. your cacao, your tea, your chai, your does it go in matcha? Yeah, we even have one that already has matcha in it. So it's like one has coffee Ooh. and the creamer. The other is matcha and the creamer. And the other yeah. is just the creamer. And they all have right. um, medicinal mushrooms in them and just mm -hmm. the highest quality ingredients. Like Patrick has really – it's been so beautiful to see his devotion to not taking shortcuts and witnessing how easy it is and how much devotion it takes as someone who creates a food product to not put any crap in there. <laughs> so yeah, I'm so proud of him and I'm really, really excited. It, I use it every morning. I haven't been because I'm about to go on dieta as I turn 30 in the jungle. So I'm going caffeine free at the moment, but yeah, I normally have it every morning. It's so damn good. So good. <laughs> and um, I'll have him on when the product comes out. I love talking to people who have created products that people end up loving and using a lot because mm -hmm. there's some wisdom in those folks where they just saw something and they materialized it out of thin air from a thought. Yeah. I think it's I love that, that. Me too. And I think for him, it was like, he was just doing it for us for two years and didn't even think. And he was trying to, you know, think of his next product. He's an entrepreneur and, and a food entrepreneur at that. And it was right under our noses. And isn't that always the way that you're like, hang on a minute, why are we yeah. trying to construct something? This is the thing that we actually want and need in the world. <laughs> like, let's just make that. Oh, that's just so good. We had it on that long hike that we took on the 5th of July this year. And uh, at the very top mm -hmm. where the Alpine Lake is, where we all went naked, <laughs> freezing cold plunge. <laughs> Holy God. Yes. Um, they bust out this product. What's it going to be called? Autonomy. It's A-U-T-O-N-O-M-E. Uh, and nice. I think it's Autonomy Foods on Instagram. Amazing. Well, we are looking forward to that. I know I am. And yeah. I know my, my household is. I truly, truly thank you from my heart. <laughs> and let's tell our listener where we can find you and your work. Yeah, the best place to connect is on Instagram and I'm at Angelika Alana, A-N-G-E-L-I-K-A-A-L-A-N-A. -A -A -A. And that's kind of the riverhead where you can find all the links to, I have a podcast, which I have an episode with beautiful Alina on there. If you want to hear that, it's called Awakened Love and my website's there and you can sign up for group coaching and all the things. So that's the riverhead is Instagram. Perfect. Perfect. And I want to say uh, one last time just to honor you and your wisdom. Mm -hmm. It is a real honor, a real pleasure to have you here. And I look forward to our next time. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful to know you, sister.